Benjamins, let's talk about the state of recruiting, where college football is at now, and can schools like Wisconsin compete in this new landscape? You are Locked On Badgers, your daily podcast on the Wisconsin Badgers, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What's going on, Badger fans? Welcome to Locked On Badgers, your team every single day. Really do appreciate, as always, every single one of you tuning in, helping build the community. Thank you. Thank you so much. Today's episode brought to you by LinkedIn. These days, every new potential hire can feel like a high stakes wager for your small business. That's why LinkedIn Jobs helps you find the people for your team faster and for free. Post your job for free at LinkedIn.com slash Lockdown College terms and conditions to apply. Uh, and we have a guest. I'm really excited about this one. We have Dan Fedrosi on 15 years as a college coach, offensive coordinator, Northern Michigan, uh, founded Aaron LLC, which is a recruiting. I'm going to let you tell me about it, but a recruiting consulting uh, firm company. You are the owner yep. president of that. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for jumping on the show. And tell me what you got going on now. What is Aaron? Yeah, thanks, Ryan. Thanks for having me. I follow all your stuff. You do a great job covering, obviously, the Badgers. I'm a born and raised Michigan Wolverine fan, so I follow you closely. Um, and I think everything you put out there is, is great. And I love I'm a big fan of the Big Ten. I grew up in the Big Ten. You know, and Aaron Consulting was something that I came up with after I finished up my career. I decided to step away from coaching, and I still wanted to, you know, impart some things that I learned. And I partner with high schools and families to really educate them through the process. You know, it's a recruiting service that's about educating First and foremost, the high school coaches, which I think is a valuable piece in the recruiting process. I don't want it to get lost. And I think we're in a day and age where it's very fine line. You know, sometimes the high school coaches are heavily involved and sometimes they're not. And I am a big advocate of making sure that they are still involved with all the schools I work with in the state of Wisconsin, some in Michigan, some out in Pennsylvania, down in Georgia and Tennessee. Uh, it was something that I thought was important to press forward and say we have to keep the high school coach as involved as possible and then also educate families on kind of what's real out there. What do I see? What do I know uh, based off of my experience that you should be focusing on as you're going through this process? Which it makes it very dynamic because every family is completely different and every coach and program are completely different. So uh, it's been great to get to know some, some really good programs in the state of Wisconsin. Again, primarily focused around the Waukesha, Milwaukee area, which is where I'm located. But, uh, you know, just getting to know some of these programs and the coaches, especially in the game of football and how invested they are into their kids. Um, is really only catapulted me to want to do this more because uh, three years ago when I started this, I really had no idea what it was going to be. But you see some – all coaches are passionate. But in this state, and, and again, I, I can only speak to the ones I talk to, the coaches that I work with on a daily basis, on a weekly basis, they are extremely passionate about their teams, getting better, and then also the recruiting process. Um, so those are some of the big things that I try to help and assist with and uh, hopefully you know, make their lives a little bit easier but also keep, uh, you know, giving, keeping them on the for forefront of the recruiting process for their kids and families. Well, I want to go there quick and just expand on that. So Wisconsin this this year picked up a bunch of transfer portal linebackers. Leon Lowry was one of them, right? And he had a kind of a an NIL agent. I don't know if you followed the story or not. And then, yeah. you know, it, it seemed like potentially, and I don't want to put myself into anything, but it seems like potentially an NIL agent maybe had his own kind of interest in that. Leon Lowry decommitted. The agent um, cause it was removed from Leon Lowry's camp and he recommitted to Wisconsin. Um, how difficult is it now with NIL, with different people, with different agencies involved, with collectives and schools to, to kind of maintain the priorities for these families and these players? Well, I mean, you got to remember now you're talking what you're talking about is the top one percent, you know, and one thing that I and for all your your fans, obviously, are going to be big Badger fans, but not everyone's going to play at Wisconsin. You know, and I think from a recruiting standpoint, and I say this to families all the time, you know, I'm a born and raised, you know, Wolverine fan. I played at a school called Saginaw Valley State University. I still followed the Wolverines. Just because I went to Saginaw Valley didn't mean that I had to give up that passion. You know, so maybe if you have a son or a daughter that goes on to play at whether it be Carroll or UW Stout, doesn't mean that, you know, that passion for them has to be lost with the Badgers. So when I hear stories like that, first and foremost, you know, we have created an element, whether you like it or not, where these players and their families now have to consider those things, you know, taking on NIL agents. How important is that to you? And it's not as important to everybody as some may think. That story, that's understandable. I think that's tough on the kid. But I also have stories within some of my programs where families were turned off by NIL conversation and they decided not to go places because the, the schools brought that up. My, my reason for bringing that up is everybody is trying to figure this out on the fly. 
You know, there's so little guardrails. There's so little, you know, regulation that some people have NIL agents, some people don't. And then the college coaches, they don't really know until you kind of express what's going on because we're all trying to catch up so fast. So when you hear stories like that, I first and foremost feel bad for the kid. I mean, this is, now I know he's a transfer. What is he, maybe 18, 19, maybe 20 years old if he's a transfer. That is a lot for these kids. And I'm not afraid to say it. The one thing that I don't like about the NIL approach is the pressure on the kids. You know, I always tell this story and I, my most enjoyable time in my life that I can remember me and my wife was when I made $4,000 as a graduate assistant at Grand Valley. Now I make a heck of a lot more money than that. And my life isn't any better, right. you know, and I think now we're creating an element where first and foremost, there are kids out there who have to think about these big money, you know, in market situations. That's a lot of pressure. That's a lot to be thinking about at 17 years old when you should be going to the prom, when you should be pl- running track, even though you're a football recruit. But then you also have these players who are not in that market who make these assumptions that that's going to funnel down to them as well just because they're in the same sport. So we have such a divide that people are confused. You know, I I talk to families all the time, and sometimes I'll bring up the fact that, hey, schools do have NIL. They can't offer it to you. I'm not going to get into the whole rules and restrictions, but it is something that you can discuss. You know, hey, you know, school A, what is your education on the NIL? When, if my son or daughter does go here, do you guys provide resources and at least help them? A lot of parents and families don't even know that you can talk about that. And then some are already far off and they have agents and all those things. So you have to find this balance. And I always come back to saying it's so hard for these kids. And I just think it's too much. I don't think it's changing anytime soon. And I think there's a lot of people who are really attaching themselves to these young people to really, you know, better themselves in with a wealth standpoint. I'm not a big fan of that. You know, I'm all about educating people. Doesn't make me any more right or wrong. But the pressure these kids are under to hear a story like that about a kid who just wants to go play college right. football and awesome. You get a chance to make money off your name, image, and likeness. Now, great. I, I'm not here to tell you that's wrong. But boy, to bring those kind of conversations, that should be like professional talk stuff. That should be the conversations of, you know, I thought I was going to sign with the Cowboys and I decided to end up signing with my Detroit Lions. That shouldn't be decisions, in my opinion, for 18, 19-year-olds. Year old, and in some cases, I hate to hear that those situations even come up, but it's the current climate, and it's something that they have to understand. If you want to go down that road, um, it's going to drastically change your experience. And if that's what you're uh, looking for, well, fair enough that the, uh, the opportunities in this day and age have been provided for you. So it's really hard on the kids, and I, I don't love that. Uh, yeah, great. Money's awesome, but you know, money has a funny way of coming and going. Uh, so I would always encourage any any kid and family to be very careful chasing that money too much. Um, you know, really try to think about what's what's in the best interest for you as is your family. You know, but it's hard on the college coaches too. They don't know. You know, they're trying to figure this out. Uh, so so I'm not trying to play the fence here, but I just think it's hard on everybody. This new landscape has has just created such a dynamic that. Almost nobody knows what they're walking into on a daily basis. I really don't know how the college coaches do it. Again, I'm not here to defend them, but at the end of the day, how you wake up each day and really kind of not know what you're walking into from a roster standpoint. What kid's going to walk into my office tomorrow and ask for money because he can or she can. Boy, I mean, I'm not really sure how you navigate that scenario. And the biggest thing I say to people, and then I'll I'll let you jump right back in. I told you before I can talk. I love it. But what, what you see. And the biggest investment in major college football and major college women, men's and women's basketball is the personnel departments. And when you start seeing terms like general manager, director of scouting, they are mirroring the NFL model. It tells you that we are close and we're already there, excuse me. But we're getting to a point now where the recruiting will probably very little of it be, will be done by the position coaches like it used to be only four or five years ago. The general managers will handle all the negotiation type stuff. If we ever get to that point where the schools just do it, they'll be talking to agents. They'll be talking to those things. And then the coaches will just coach. I mean, it is crazy how fast we have turned major college football, especially into a, you know, a pseudo minor league uh, that really, that really uh, mirrors the NFL. It's just, it's insane to see how fast it's happened. Well, I love having you on here so we can dive in kind of into that perspective because there's so many questions and I do need to take a quick break, but I want to come back and I want to talk about, where And this is a super loaded question, and we could do an entire show on this. I'm sure you talk about this for hours. I'm sure you have it at points. But where do you see this going? I'm, I'm going to try to get a condensed version of that. And when I say see this going to me, NIL, are there going to be contracts? Are there going to be binding agreements? 
Um, I really want to get your brain on that. And then how does Wisconsin compete to that? If it, is it easier or harder for them? We're going to talk about that next on Lockdown Badgers with Dan. But first, a quick break for our friends of the show over at LinkedIn. LinkedIn remains your number one source for all your hiring needs. Right now, every, every hire is a high-stakes wager, and it's actually very fortuitous that we have Dan on for a show talking about hiring, and he's a recruiting guy, recruiting – you know, he's analyzing that market. LinkedIn is about recruiting talent, too. If you're a hiring manager, you need to have the best pool of talent out there. Um, that's what LinkedIn is. Best professional uh, sourcing for, for talent. They have uh, tools that basically – and your interviewees are going to take questionnaires to either say, yeah, they're qualified for this or they're not. And that's going to save them time. It's going to save you time. If you save time, you save money. And that's what it is all about. It's why small businesses continue to rate LinkedIn jobs. Number one, delivering quality hires versus leading competitors. LinkedIn Jobs helps you find the qualified candidates you want to talk to faster. Post your job for free at LinkedIn.com slash Lockdown College. That's LinkedIn.com slash Lockdown College. Post your job for free. Terms and conditions do apply. All right, let's get Dan back on your coach. Uh, I want to ask, and I kind of teased it before the break, where do you see this ultimately going? Because it feels like we're in the middle of something that isn't the finished product. Yeah, I mean, the problem is the lack of leadership. You know, you've got on one hand this NCA, which is a regulating body. I mean, I think people always get confused on what the NCA is. They're just a governing body that ultimately does what the presidents and chancellors um, want the rules that they want them to follow up with. You know, so we've got this push and pull from the NCA, and then we've got this push and pull from primarily major college football. That has become its own animal from a revenue standpoint. So the fact that there's really no overarching leader. And, you know, I, I saw some comments by Coach Saban today, and it's almost like you just wish somebody would put him in place or somebody like that, maybe even a Gene Smith, the retiring AD from Ohio State, and say, you're in charge, okay? Yes, Greg Sankey and Tony Petiti, you're going to answer to them, but someone has to take control of this and say, what do we want from major college football and, uh, and major college uh, men's and women's basketball? Because the problem is, if this continues to go down the road of these players becoming, um, you know, like what Dartmouth did, where they unionized to be, try to become employees, and you start going down that road, you're going to have to make decisions with college sports. And I know everyone thinks they're all just making millions and millions and millions. I'm here to tell you, a strong majority of these programs, even at the Badgers, they're, they're operating at a loss. You know, and you talk about some of those major programs that are operating a loss. How can you pay the players when you right now aren't even turning a profit? Can football sustain your rowing team at every school? And then you start trickling that down to the smaller colleges, even the North Dakota states and the South Dakota states of the world. You know, can you sustain paying players as employees at every level? I think that's the concern that I have about going to this contract model and employee model that I really think we are getting to a point where that's going to say, this is just about football and men's and women's basketball. And I don't agree with that. You know, I got a chance to coach for a long time. And you know what? Getting a chance to see those soccer players, men's and women, and see what they experienced was awesome. Okay, now they never played in front of six, seven, eight thousand 8,000 people like we did when I was at a Division II school, which is not what the Badgers are playing in front of. But I think we've got to be very careful about what we want from this. Just because one of the entities is a billion-dollar operation, primarily because of the TV revenue, we got to be careful. You know, at the end of the day, there's a lot of people involved in this. Congress can't seem to make up their mind. I have a lot of opinions on that. That'll, that's a whole probably a whole nother show as far as the politics behind it. But without an overarching leader, like the NFL has, you know, uh, Commissioner Goodell. And a lot of people don't like him, but he's the one who sits there and takes the arrows and sets the direction. And until college football primarily gets that, you're always going to continue to have this push and pull of people wanting to get the, the largest piece of that massive pie, right? I mean, you've got this billion dollar pie that Greg Sankey doesn't want to give up his 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 poll. Tony Petiti doesn't want to give up his poll. The University of Alabama and the University of Michigan, they want to continue to get their money. Why would you give away your power and your money? So that's the big concern I have as far as where it's going. And the reason I give a long, I don't know. There's so many dynamics, Ryan, that, okay, great, you do contracts. You know, I mean, that may solve a small portion of this. You know, I really don't think NIL is the problem the more I've considered it. The transfer portal is, is very concerning. You know, again, what do we want from this? I want players to have freedom. I would be a, I'm a big supporter of the kids having options. But at some point, what are we doing to, to kind of disassociate professional from some form of an amateur? And I think we definitely swung the pendulum way too far. You know, so what's going to happen in the future is going to be very um, interesting. And I ultimately think, and I hate to say it, but football is going to drive it. 
you know, it's making too much money. It's going to be the driver. And the schools that are at the top are going to succeed. And what's going to happen to those middle and lower level schools is where my concern is. It's where I spent so much of my career. You know, the Badgers, the Wolverines, the Crimson Tide, they're always going to survive. You know, but at the end of the day, it comes down to, you know, what about the Valparaisos of the world? You know, what about the Tennessee Chattanoogas? What about all the people that have been given opportunities to play at those programs or even the MAC level? I mean, how on earth is Northern Illinois and Central Michigan going to survive if they have to pay their players? And and then if you have a football break away into their own division, if the Badgers are in this super conference, are they going to schedule, you know, Miami of Ohio? And if they don't, how are they going to be able to pay their bills? Because a lot of times that game will ultimately fund a lot of athletic departments at that second tier, that MAC level, or even lower. So I have a lot of concerns about the direction, and I think ultimately someone's going to have to step uh, step up and say, this is what's best for the whole sport, not just for one of the sports, and that's football. Yeah, it's, it's very interesting that you mentioned the the other non-revenue sports. So I was talking with Rajiv, who's been on the show several times, and I, I expressed the same thing. I said, I think schools are going to end up cutting the programs and I don't I don't like it Rajiv didn't like it but it just feels like that could be a natural path as schools try to figure out how to pay players and you get into an arms race well you know and I, I don't want to use this as a I, this is not a great example but I, when I was playing I, I played college football at a school called Saginaw Valley and my last win was against a school called University of Nebraska Omaha okay and a few years later University of Nebraska Omaha shut down football because they wanted to move to division one okay now that was Trev Alberts, who's now the AD at Nebraska, and, and there may have been some other reasonings for that, but to be able to move up to Division One, they couldn't afford to fund football at the Division Two level. So they shut down football and wrestling to move up and enhance other sports, which is great for those other sports. And I think that's a wonderful school. I have no, no qualms with that, but that's the only example I can give of you're just not going to get everything making this jump in this move. So I, I have a lot of concerns. I'm very concerned about the direction of college sports because it, it really is a great element that I think we're just losing because of the chase of money. And, 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 and I hate to use the word greed, but there's a lot of people making a lot of money out there. I'd love to see the players get more, but why does it, you know, I just don't know if we continue to do more and not have a, a cutting at some point of, of some sports or some programs or some levels even. Let me ask you this. Is this, because I think you could potentially make the argument that in some ways this is a bit of an extension of how it's always been to some degree, right? We talk about how could a Mac school pay players. That's an incredible, but a Mac school has never really been able to compete to some degree with the Blue Bloods. Does it feel like just a natural extension of, of what college football has been? Or is this, yeah. maybe, this maybe something? Cool? No, nothing. It's, it's funny because in all this change, really nothing's changed. Mm-hmm. You know, let's just use football for an example. I mean, who are the same five teams contending for the national title every year? Okay, you threw Washington in there this year, and for a lot of people, they're not familiar with that success. Well, I remember the Chris Peterson era of Washington, who was, I think, one of the one of the first few Final Four teams when they, you know, went to that model. Not the first, but one of the first few teams. I remember in the 90s when, when they were one of the top teams after, I think, splitting a national title with either Michigan or somebody. You know, so at the end of the day, what we keep thinking is that this is going to change stuff. Nothing ever changes because what is ultimately going to happen is the rich are just going to continue to get richer. And I've actually used this example. And as a Big Ten fan, obviously, and maybe some of your Badger fans will will, will think of this. You know, we had all this big deal with the Michigan sign, uh, sign stealing uh, scandal this year. Right. I've actually made the argument we have way too many rules. You know what we should actually be doing? Allowing schools to find that specific niche that can make them a successful team. And maybe sign stealing is the answer. And I know this is maybe a moral and an ethical thing, but think about a Vanderbilt. You know, Northwestern ended up having a good season, and Coach Braun did a fantastic job. But imagine if Northwestern could find that something, okay, that could help them win on a Saturday and beat a Michigan or Ohio State every mm-hmm. once in a while. Because to me – I think what we're doing by trying to create this parody hasn't created any parody at all. And I'm a big NASCAR fan. If you listen and follow NASCAR enough, it's the same three teams and the same three drivers that are winning the championship every year. And there's so that car is the exact same. It's pretty, they all have the exact same frame and the same teams, the Hendricks and the Penske's win it every single year. I actually think this, 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 all these rules and regulations we think are going to create parity and allow the San Jose States of the world to jump in and win are not. I'd actually like to see the Badgers be able to find what's something that we can think of that Michigan can't. You know, and, and I'm not talking about as long as you're not harming players. If you can find something in there that can give you a little bit of an advantage, let's allow these coaches and these people to kind of use some of their ingenuity. 
let's go out and find something. Let's not harm the players. We're not talking about that, but something. I think actually the sign steal, and I'd look at it and say, you should let people do that. You know what? At the end of the day, if you can't figure out in two plays as a coach on, on the opposing sideline, hey, they know our plays, so let's switch them, then maybe you shouldn't be getting paid all that money to be able to coach. And you're not very smart instead of going out and changing the rules. Instead of doing all these things. And I just, to me, it's where are sports going to really, truly create parity? I don't think any of this is really changing anything. Uh, like you said, I think it's just, it's the same cycle of teams. And this is only going to enhance it even more. No matter how many times you expand this playoff, it's not going to, you're going to end up seeing the same four teams in it almost roughly every year. Well, I would argue parity isn't necessarily good for college football. Even even if right. you are trying to create it. Uh, I don't think, I think people lose sight of, you know, college football is important because of the important teams. I hate, I hate to, it sounds super arrogant, but I, right. I think that, that matters. How is it for schools in the Wisconsin tier? And you, you could lump, you know, it, whether that's Iowa types, whether it's, you know, South Carolina right. types, whoever's in that tier, I think you, that's a pretty broad um, generalization. But does this shift towards more open NIL? Does it help or hurt schools in that tier, do you think? Well, I mean, ultimately, I think it can help them if they choose to go that road. And that's always comes down to morals and ethics. You know, if Wisconsin wants to sit here and say, we're going to buy our way to a national title in the game of football, they can absolutely do it. The pathway is there right now. You know, invest in your collective. Forget about renovating the stadium. Forget about fancy weight rooms. I mean, people don't remember. There was a time back in the NFL when I was a lot younger where nobody had any fancy locker rooms. The Lions used to come up to Saginaw Valley and go to camp, and they would practice in these little, you know, almost little, little dungy bubbles and everything. And that was because at the end of the day, you just bought the best players, you know, in free agency. And obviously the draft is a part of it too. But at the end of the day right now, if you want to just sit here and say, we can buy our team and buy our way to a national title, you can do that. So this model currently is actually better for the Badgers of the world if you want to consider them as a second tier. It comes down to what does your administration, what does your coaching staff want to do? You know, does Coach Fickle want to say, we don't care about, because here would be my approach. I'm just going to be honest. If I were Coach Fickle, now listen, I love high school recruiting. I believe in it to my bones. But if I were truly in his seat, I might consider only recruiting the portal. Why? Why not take a kid who can help us right now who's 19 or 20 years old? But I think he has morals and he has ethics and he has a belief in the game that he's not going to do that. That's my opinion. That's my evaluation from what I've seen. So I think it's great. But if I were really somebody that all I cared about was winning the national title, let's go buy our way to a championship. Let's be the New York Yankees. You know, so this model where we're currently at creates the opportunity that if you've got a big booster, if you've got people behind you, I'd stop investing in weight rooms. I'd stop investing in indoor facilities. I'd just go buy talent and we'd win and we'd look at our fans and say, okay, is that what you wanted? Yeah, here we go. And then if the fans say, yeah, we don't really want to win that way, then you go back to kind of doing it, again, the way I think a lot of people are anyways. But this model, actually, absolutely, if you want to go that road, if everybody's all in together, you know, the uh, the sayings of, you know, the roll the boat stuff, we're all in this together, we're all going to walk the same path. If everybody wants to go down this road, it actually probably allows you an opportunity, as long as you can find the dollars to kind of buy those players. I don't fundamentally agree with it. I don't fundamentally believe in it. But at the end of the day, it's there. Um, some people might be taking it to the nth degree. And is it working? Well, I'd obviously have to get on the insides of those programs because I don't know. But I think when you look from the outside, there's still a lot of people that are winning doing it the right way, to the, to the best that I can tell. You know, I'm not on the insides of these programs, but there are a lot of programs, you know, who are not completely just trying to buy themselves wins. You know, and, and I think maybe even you could look at a Michigan versus like a Texas A&M. And again, no offense to Coach Fisher, but it, all reports are they put a lot of investment yeah. into their NIL collectives. And by all reports, Michigan was a little bit different. They weren't using it through recruiting. They were trying to invest in their players. So I think you can look at it and say you can have success in this model, but it comes down to what do we want and how do we want to approach this thing as a program. So I think a Wisconsin absolutely could have success, but I think they're going to have success doing it what I believe is going to, going to be the right way, the way I see Coach Fickle trying to approach his pro. I think you could actually even see it in the recruiting classes. His, his direction, I think, is going to be very successful, and I would – be shocked in the next couple of years if they're not actually in one of those, you know, what I would call a top tier program. Let's go. By the way, it's, it's funny. Wisconsin is in the midst of a massive stadium and weight room renovation. So yep. <laughs> like it's kind of funny. And they're trying to get a new indoor and everything yep. too. And I get yep. it, but that's not, and again, I'll make this real brief, but now you've got the ADs fighting with the collectives to try to get that money from the boosters because we want a new indoor. 
but the person who's in charge of the collective is trying to boost their collective so they can buy players. So you've got this really weird power paradigm shift that's going on right now. And I think either Congress is going to have to step in or someone would have to overtake this thing and say, this is what we're doing, whether you like it or not, the world. And that's the only way this thing will change. But yeah, it's it's a very dynamic approach now. You've got the you've got the NIL collective director walking in and asking for, you know, Dan Fedrosi for twenty million, and then 10, 10 minutes later comes in the AD and says, "Hey, I need twenty million also." And at some point, I mean, there's only so many Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk's out there in the world that we can ask for that much money. At some point, it's it's going to kind of come to a head. Yeah, the well runs dry at some point. All right, we're going to yeah. take one more quick break. Come back for a few more minutes with Dan and with guests like. Dan, we always, man, I always say I run out of time before questions. So I, I appreciate it. We have more questions. We're going to come back and talk specifically about Luke Fickle, that staff, and some thoughts on some of the Badger um, recent commits with Dan. Uh, but first, a quick break for our friends of the show over at Fire TV. I, I'm a new I'm a new believer in, in Amazon Fire TV. They are incredible. It's your destination for all your sports, live game highlights, in-depth analysis. Fire TV offers an amazing viewing experience. And for me, I need stuff that's easy, right? I'm an old school guy. I'm not young. I'm, I just need plug it in and it works. A user interface is incredible. Seamless, fast, easy to use, and a ton of content. Fire TV recently created Fire TV channels to deliver a constant supply of the latest videos from your favorite sports fans all for free, which includes all of us over at the Locked On Network. We're part of this too. So with your Fire Amazon Fire TV, you can get Locked On content there as well. Not to mention great news, entertainment, gaming, travel, cooking videos. It's all there. Check out Fire TV channels on Fire TV and Alexa devices. Check them out. Again, Fire TV channels on Fire TV, Alexa devices, uh, your sports destination. To learn more, visit amazon.com slash Locked On Fire TV. That's amazon.com slash Locked On Fire TV. You will not regret it. It is the absolute best. All right, let's get Dan back on here, finish up. And again, man, I, I really appreciate it. I feel like I could talk with you about this over a beer for five hours and and not be done. Um, I want to go back to, you mentioned Luke Fickle. What are your thoughts on, on the staff that the Badgers put together starting last year? Yeah, I think the staff's really good, honestly. I'm a big believer in Coach Fickle, and I think I go back to his Ohio State time. You know, Coach Fickle learned a lot from that year. He was the interim head coach. That's the year I'm talking about. Okay. When he went as the interim head coach and took over when Coach um, Tressel, you know, it was, again, uh, that, uh, that whole dynamic, whether he's let go or fired or whatnot. But Coach Tressel was let go, and he took over, and they struggled. I think he learned a lot from that, and I saw that play out at Cincinnati. Okay, And I think, in my opinion, I'm not here to talk about what happened with the previous staff, but when they did hire Coach Fickle, I said, man, that guy is a dynamic coach based off of his experience struggling early having success at Cincinnati, in my opinion, sets him up very well for this job. And I think you see some things that they're doing in the recruiting game that are very impressive. But I even go back, you know, when I watched that Ohio State game last year, and that Badgers team was right there. And Brandon, excuse me, Braylon Allen got hurt, I think, on the one-yard line on that fourth and one. Had they scored, I'm just telling you, that might have been a different game. But something happened to that team a couple weeks later because I saw them struggling a little bit. They were kind of struggling. I think they were trying to de- decipher as a team, maybe in that locker room, not speaking for any players, but they looked like they were struggling. Are we truly going to invest in Coach Fickle and this staff? You know, they obviously care deeply about Coach Christ and his staff, and I, that to me is awesome. But something changed. They looked like they started to become Coach Fickle's team, and that is extremely scary for the Big Ten, and especially for my Michigan Wolverines, and I think anybody else. And I think he's shown to do that. You're not getting a rookie head coach who just had a – you know, a lucky, a lucky uh, drop in the bucket year at Cincinnati where they went uh, on that great run. I think you have an experienced coach who understands the game, and I think you see that in, in recruiting. And I'll just comment on this real quick. When you look at that 2023 class, again, it was a lot less, and he came in with the way the, the coaching cycles are now. You come into that December signing day, and you're kind of just trying to get some players. I'm just going to be honest, and as I've evaluated that over the last couple of years, that is really hard on those coaches, and I think administrators really have to consider – giving these coaches more time because that first class is probably not going to be your premier class. You know, five years ago, you used to, you used to be able to, Hey, make a splash hire and then land a dynamic class in February. That's not the case anymore. So I saw some of those players, you know, and, and we talked a little bit off air, you know, the Snowden kid over in Rose from Roseville, Michigan, I think he's going to be a dynamic player. He's got some length. He's going to be a really good one for him. But in that 23 class, there were some just good players, in my opinion. They're all going to be Big Ten, uh, excellent Big Ten players. They're going to contribute for the Badgers. But I even thought about some, you know, I looked at some of these guys. You know, the Van Dyne kid from Menasha, linebacker, has, does some really nice things, plays a lot of different positions. 
You know, I even looked, there was a linebacker, and I, I might, I might kind of massacre his name, but the Milza kid, yep. big, massive lineman. I know that's always kind of fit the, you know, the approach of Wisconsin. So there were some good, solid players, a receiver out of Hawaii, I believe. I think his first name was Tech. And I was right. like, man, these kids, yeah, Trek, people, Trek. People love Trek. Good, solid player. But when you look at this 2024 class, the thing that stuck out to me more than anything was length. And when you start now, take some good players in that first class, and your next class is more about length, and you're kind of starting to fit some tangible things. And uh, the kid that jumps off the, the, the page, obviously, is the, the Gothier kid from Bayport. I hope I said that right. Gothier, yep. People are probably going to watch him and see him strike people in the physicality. That actually isn't what sticks off the page for me as a former college coach. His athleticism in space is incredible. Okay, now again, for the, the common viewer, you're going to see him hit people and knock people around and all, so that's great. That kid and his length is going to just be dynamic in space, which is what college football is now. You know, and another player, and again, I could, I could just talk for days oh, on this, but there was, there was, there's two more that really stuck out to me. Obviously, Derek Jensen is somebody that I'm very connected with, and I work with the Arrowhead program. Derek has good length, but his ability to move at that size, again, so you start talking about taking next level players versus just really good players. Okay, and I think that's what you saw out of this 24 class. But there was a running back. And again, I hope I'm saying his name right. But Darian Dupree, yep. here's the thing that's unique about him. He looks like a scheme fit like to the perfect degree for me. He's much different than Braylon. And I don't know if he can survive running in the A-gap 30 times a game. But what that tells me is they're starting to become a little more selective. They're starting to become a team that says, okay, this kid's obviously really good, but he can fit exactly what we're starting to do. So we must have enough of a base of a foundation of those 23 class. They've obviously hopefully still kept a lot of players, you know, and avoided the transfer portal. But that's some scary stuff. And then there was, you know, you even look at Rob Booker, for instance. Yep. You know, Rob Booker and the Steck tight end from down in Illinois. The thing that stuck out to me, again, this is the overriding term that I saw, length. And what those two players create is radius. Like that is a massive catch radius for Rob Booker. Okay, the speed looks okay. You know, I don't know if he's as twitchy as I would love to see, like in space and making his breaks, but they'll develop that. That's what I'm getting at. Like I watch that and I'm like, ooh, that's the easiest thing for them to develop. But catch radius, ability to the quarterback not to have to throw into a window this small. Instead, the window is this big. You saw them taking some players like that. And I'm like, ooh, that's when it starts to get scary. Because kids, it's one thing to take a good player, but now you take a player with tangibles, like a Rob Booker, like the Dupree kid, and you're like, wow, they fit into our system. And then there's this, there's this, say, they have him down as an athlete, that Raphael Dunn, I think yes. he's out of Alabama. Wow, good, you bet, that kid's going to be a problem because he is so twitchy in space. You know, and again, for the, I don't, I don't mean to disrespect anybody, but for the layperson who watches it, you're always enamored by the touchdowns and the big hits. That kid's movement skills in space, twitchy like that, they signed a lot of kids like that, that, you know, again, their they're big plays were obviously exciting, but there's some stuff in there that you're like, whoa, those kids are going to be a problem once they develop for other teams in the league. Um, and so that was kind of cool to see two classes. His first class, I think he just grabbed as many good players as he could get. That next class, they really started targeting some tangible things. That's a really good balance, in my opinion. And I think I give them a lot of credit for doing that and really balancing out that next class and saying, you know, this is this is what you need to do to compete at this level. Very impressive, honestly, from what I saw. Man, you're getting me excited, Coach. Well, let's go. I, if they yeah. develop, if they develop and the kids stick around, which I'm a big fan of, that team could be extremely impressive. And I, I'm, I'm a big believer in that coaching staff. I think Coach Fickle and, you know, I work for Coach Mitchell. Uh, I haven't talked to him in a long. I actually saw him at a youth basketball game. His son was playing and my son was playing. But I think they have some dynamic recruiters and some guys that are going to develop those kids. And their personnel department staff, I've heard really good things about as far as, you know, the, the off the field work that they're doing. I, I, I'm excited for them. Uh, again, living in this day, I, I'm pretty impressed with what they're doing, in my opinion. Man, I have a billion more questions, but I, I am going to let you go and be very respectful of your time. I know you're all over the map. Are you in Pittsburgh now? No, I just got back from Pittsburgh, back okay. in back in Waukesha now, so back home. Okay, yeah, so I really, really appreciate it. Where I, I have your Twitter account linked on the show. People can see that, but is there anywhere else people can go and check out kind of what you're doing or get more information on what you got going on with Aaron? Yeah, people can check out my site at getaaron.com. It's G-E-T-A-R-E-N.com. Love to have people take out, take a look at some of the education stuff we talk about. Reach out if you have any questions. And I work with a lot of programs throughout the country. So it's something I really enjoy.
Love it, man. He is Dan Pedrosi. I really do appreciate the time. For everyone that tuned in, thank you so, so much on Wisconsin, and we'll talk again tomorrow.